Okay, so here we are with, uh, we're wrapping up Luke Cage and Iron Fist here. Okay, so, uh, episode 11 of Luke Cage is Now You're Mine, and this picks up from the shootout that ended episode 10. Uh, Luke is carrying Misty, he's trying to get her to the club's kitchen. Uh, there's gunshots all around, one of them wings uh, Misty in the arm. Uh, Diamondback basically... Uh, in the, they corner themselves into the kitchen eventually. Uh, Luke barricades the door. Dynamic orders his men to get some explosives so they can work their way in. Uh, as this happens, Luke takes Misty down into the, uh, basically the alcohol closet or the alcohol cellar, which is a false bottom door that they just open up and they go down into. Uh, as this is happening, Shades confronts um, uh, Diamondback and uh, Diamondback explains a little bit of what he's planning and Shades actually responds with, what you talking about, Willis? And Diamondback looks at him and goes, really? You're doing that joke now? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Misty is bleeding out from her arm due to the wound. Uh, I thought that this would wind up with her uh, amp getting an amputated, because I know uh, in Defender she has a new mechanically powered arm, but uh, no, she actually keeps it at least through the end of this series. Um, Luke kind of fills her in on Diamondback, and she tells him to go and help out the people who are being held hostage, but he says, look, they're, I know they have the uh, ammunition that can harm me, so I can't just uh, go up there and do that. Uh, as this is happening, Claire herself was uh, taken hostage, and she starts working with them to get so that she can get to Luke and set up a possible escape. Uh, as this is happening, uh, Mariah Dillard has been uh, negoti begins negotiating with the mayor's office to arm the police force with the Judas ammunitions. Um, Diamondback uh, basically uses uh, Boone, who is uh, Mariah's political rival. Uh, uh, the count, the sort of I'm trying to think. Of, she's like a councilwoman, and he's like a junior councilman who's trying to gun for her. Who's been gunning for her position. Uh, he uses her to, uh, sorry, he uses Boone to negotiate until eventually he gets fed up with it, with Boone and, uh, kills Boone with the same device that he's been killing cops with, so it looks like Luke Cage did it. Um, Diamondback takes his last, uh, Judas bolt and then, uh, challenges Luke. And, uh, Luke, uh, cuts the power to the building so he can try to remain as hidden as he can. Uh, th as this happened... Claire and Misty, uh, they get together, and uh, Claire manages to get the bullet out of uh, Misty's arm and patch her up enough so that they can at least co uh, combo up and take down Shades. Um, it's at this point the SWAT gets the clearance to use the Judas bullets. They uh, enter the building as uh, Diamondback shoots at Luke but misses, and he slips out the back. And Luke is kind of left holding the bag. Uh, as this was happening, uh, Diamondback took uh, Candace, the woman that had been the bribed witness from Mariah Dillard, for, uh, the witness who said that uh, Cottonmouth was killed by Luke Cage. Mm, excuse me. Uh, he took her hostage briefly and then dropped her off the balcony so that Luke would save her rather than go after him. So, anyway, Luke gets arrested, and as this is happening, Misty is getting wheeled into the ambulance, she stops to tell her, uh, her chief about Willis Stryker. And this leads into the next episode, uh, episode 12, Soliloquy of Chaos. Uh, Luke is being hauled off. Misty tells him that, look, um, I know you think you're playing, you're helping Claire by playing martyr here, but, uh, <laughs> uh, they know who she is. They know probably where she lives. They'll know to go after her next. Exactly. So Luke uh, basically breaks out as soon as uh, the basically the uh, the hauler stops for a homeless person crossing the street. And Diamondback, meanwhile, is at his warehouse. He's preparing down a final weapon that you don't see. Uh, basically, it's the last weapon to take down Cage. Um, as this is happening, Misty gets, later, uh, Misty gets a phone call from Candace, uh, she's in the hospital. Uh, Candace basically turns on Mariah and says, look, I was bribed to say Luke Cage did it. I actually saw who did it. I, it, I heard, uh, Mariah and the guy in the shades talking about who killed, uh, I can't think of what his name is now. Uh, 
killed uh, Cottonmouth, and yeah, the, Mariah was the one who did it. Uh, Misty gets a recording of it on her phone. Misty then gives her a pay-as-you-go phone so that she can't, it with only her number, and so that way hopefully it won't be traced. Um, anyway, as this is going around, uh, as this is happening, Luke is trying to lay low as best he can. Uh, along the way, though, he actually breaks up an armed robbery and meets Method Man from the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> and, yes, uh, so we've had an episode, uh, no, it was an episode of Iron Fist. I, one of them was directed by the RZA. Was it, I think it was Iron Fist, wasn't it? It was directed by the RZA. And now we had a Method Man appearance. Uh, later, Method Man goes on um, the radio show with Sway and I forget who the other hosts are. And, they're ta and he starts talking about Luke Cage. And this kind of inspires a uh, support Luke Cage movement. Uh, large uh, African-American men are starting to walk around in gray hoodies with bullet holes in them to basically throw police off the scent. Uh, as this is happening, uh, Diamondback uh, bails Shade out of jail, uh, tries to have him killed, but Shade comes, Shade's fights the men off and he breaks free. He then goes to visit Mariah. After, as this is happening, Diamondback also goes to visit to Mariah, drops off some cash to uh, basically refund the damage for, to the club, uh, but says, you know, yeah, when I'm done with Cage, I'll go away, but I'll never really be gone. I'll always be in the wind behind you. Uh, as this is happening, those shades uh, kind of pops in shortly after uh, Diamondback leaves. He presents Mariah with Cottonmouth's murder weapon, and the two decide that, you know, our best opportunity is to use Luke Cage and Diamondback to eliminate, hopefully eliminate each other. And maybe, if, you know, if one of them survives, they'll throw them off our tail long enough. Um, meanwhile, Luke goes back to the barbershop where he meets up with uh, the accountant, whose name I never really got in the show, unfortunately. Uh, but he's the uncle of Turk Barrett, the uh, often beat-upon lackey from both Daredevil and this show. And they use Turk to basically extract Diamondback's location. As he, as Luke arrives, uh, he finds that the Puerto Ricans who attempted to take down Diamondback have all been killed. And they've been completely manhandled because Diamondback has pulled out a secret weapon. Uh, he also finds a bomb in the warehouse and barely gets out before it explodes. Um, at this point, uh, Luke goes back to the barber shop where Shades and Mariah are waiting and they have Luke with evidence that will clear the name of Carl Lucas. They have the files that basically prove that uh, Willis Stryker, a.k.a. Diamondback, was responsible for Lucas going to prison. As is happening, Misty Knight arrives to arrest Mariah and all this gets uh, interrupted by Diamondback who's now in his uh, Justin Hammer Technology exosuit. <laughs> and um, that leads us into our 13th, and uh, the season finale, the 13th episode, You Know My Steez, which, I'm sorry, uh, any use of the word steez gives me Game Grumps flashbacks. Uh, there's one episode, or I think it's Danny is relating a story of, my friend where, of a friend where he goes, Man, you're killing my steez! Anyway, uh... This thing opens up with something I wish we'd had a little bit more throughout the series, which is a flashback to uh, a young Carl Lucas and a young Willis Stryker. Uh, they're, in a they're preparing for a boxing match uh, that uh, Carl's father is not approved of. And you, again, you see them as little kids, and as this is happening, uh, we cut this between Luke and Dimebeck as they start fighting, and it's attracting a lot of attention outside as it tumbles out to the street. Uh, in the midst of this, the files that could clear Carl Lucas's name disappear, and Misty's cell phone disappears. Uh, anyway, Luke and Dynamac, they begin to fight. They basically talk about their father really abandoned both of them. It really, and Luke points out that, you know, if you kill me, this isn't really revenge. This is just, yeah, uh, it's, you're not fixing anything. You're just, yeah, killing me. And as this is happening, Luke begins to, uh, the crowd begins to chant uh, favorably for Luke Cage. Uh, the exosuit is really super strong. It enhances uh, the strength of Diamondback as much as he can. 
as this is happening, Mariah Dillard actually goes on TV and starts talking about Carl Lucas as this convicted felon, and this is Carl Luke Cage is really Carl Lucas, and this is what happened to him. And as this is happening, Misty Knight arrests Mariah Dillard uh, on television. Uh, Luke uh, eventually begins to get the upper hand on Diamondback, uh, slams him against a wall. It, it, unfortunately, this is uh, this is a complaint I have with this episode. The fight, and the final fight, is really slow and really clunky, and it's not shot very well at all. Uh, it's hard to tell exactly what happens to Diamondback. All that knows is he basically breaks his back, and he winds up kind of paralyzed. Uh, Luke is brought back to issue a statement and clear his name because everything's finally been pushed out into the open. Uh, Mariah tries to pin everything on Luke and Diamondback, but Misty comes in and uses the uh, recorded evidence from Candace to disprove Misty's claims. Unfortunately, Misty then gets a call about Candace's body being found and she realizes I lost my cell phone and that she remembers she lost her miss she couldn't find her cell phone. And she realizes that Shades grabbed it and used that to contact Candace and get her killed. And because it's only a recording, that can't be used in a court. So, yeah, Mariah has to be let go. And this basically leads to Missy all but turning in her badge. She, yeah, she said, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of people getting off on technicalities. I can't fix this. I can't work within the system and fix the system. So that's out of here. And... Shortly afterwards, uh, federal marshals arrived to arrest Carl Lucas for escaping uh, Seagate Penitentiary. Uh, and as Carl is being led out of Harlem, we see a lot of uh, things happen. Uh, Claire uh, picks up a flyer for martial arts training from Colleen Wayne's dojo. Uh, we all know that kind of turns out, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, the accountant for the barber shop, in the wreckage of the barber shop, finds the evidence exonerating Luke Cage. So that's kind of the big thing. And we also see that Mariah has rebuilt uh, Harlem's Paradise, and now it appears that she and Shades are romantically involved. And that's kind of how everything sort of ends. Obviously, uh, Luke appears in Defenders, so he gets out of prison. I'm guessing that evidence is used to clear his name and... Uh, we'll see that when we start covering Defenders. The Incredible Hulk meets Spider-Man. Each figure a foot tall and fully poseable. All you need is a piece of string and here comes Spider-Man. Avalanche! This is a job for the Hulk. The Incredible Hulk with a face that's mean. Lots of muscle and skin that's green. Good job, handsome. The Incredible Hulk and Spider-Man from the Superhero Collection, each sold separately by Mego. We have episode 11, Lead Horse Back to Stable. Uh, we open up with a nice flashback of Davos discovering Danny after his battle with Shao Lao, which means Danny now has the mantle of the Iron Fist. And again, this is something I really wish had happened more often throughout this series and earlier throughout this series. It would have been nice to see stuff like that. That was the interesting part. Anyway, uh, we move to the present and Danny refuses to leave New York City. He explains what the hand did to his parents. Davos says, okay, look, I'll help you take down the hand, but you have to agree to come back to Kunlun after this. We cannot, yeah, be dinking around anymore. Uh, we get a little bit of an explanation later. Anyway, uh, Colleen returns to her dojo where Bakudo is waiting. And Bakudo says, Danny's too far gone. He's not going to join the hand. And you're going to need to start getting some help here because you're in a lot of trouble. Anyway, uh... Danny and Davos go back to Staple uh, to uh, visit Claire. Excuse me. Mm. Danny and Davos go to visit Claire to get Danny's wound patch up. 
Uh, she's out of the antibiotics, and it's possible that he has an infection, but also she's out of threads, so she had to staple his wound shut. Uh, at that point, she gives him a clean shirt, which is actually Luke Cage's old shirt. So as Danny picks it up, he looks, he's, there's bullet holes all over this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, Danny goes to meditate for a while, and Davos sort of explains uh, a lot of the lore of the Iron Fist. That, you know, Danny faced the mystical dragon Shao Lao, and Kaloon only appears uh, for a few years and then disappears again. And as this is happening, Colleen Wing arrives to try to patch things up, but Danny kind of refuses to accept her apology. And what basically uh, is Danny, he's still angry, and Claire actually deciphers this, even though she's not big on Eastern mysticism. She said, you have a broken heart, and you're upset right now, and that's what's keeping you from tapping into the Iron Fist. You need to overcome your emotions and try to put things behind you. You can't take everything with the weight of the world on its shoulders. Uh, it's at this point, Danny and Davos go to meet Harold Meacham. Uh, Claire warns Danny not to let his anger... Like I said, kind of throughout this, Claire's like warning Danny to not let his anger get the better of him. Uh, Harold and Joy then reveal what they've been noticing, which is that uh, Bakudo has been using the hand to transfer funds out of Rand Industries and into their own personal account. And they decide, well, we're going to bleed the hands accounts dry and shut them down that way. And then that will hopefully provide some cover for you and Davos to uh, get into the monastery, or the, I forget what I called it before, basically the hand monastery, we'll call it, and uh, shut them down and possibly uh, kill Bakudo in the, po in the process. Um, as this is happening to uh, Colleen, winds up getting caught by Bakudo, and she brought she's brought back to the monastery. She's strapped into a chair, and as you see her being wheeled through, you see all of these uh, similar uh, scenarios where they've been strapped down. People have been strapped down, and they've basically been killed. And uh, what they're going to do is obviously they're going to kill her and resurrect her and have her service the hand. Um, before anything can be carried out, though, she breaks free. She gets out of the building, and Danny and Davos see her making her escape, and Danny stops and finally does manage to patch things up with her, but Davos gets angry and kind of storms off a little bit. And that leads into episode 12, uh, Bar the Big Boss. Uh, Bakudo is, um, uh, visits, uh, sorry, visits Ward Meacham in rehab. Uh, that's where Ward was, I don't think I mentioned that last time, that yeah, Ward's in the same sanitarium that Danny was in at the beginning of the season under the guise of his drug problems. Uh, Bakudo gives him a special drug to help him get over the withdrawal of the synthetic heroin that uh, Ward had been addicted to. Offers to help, yeah, help Ward, but wants to say, look, you'll join us, but we're not going to ever bring you back from the dead. Like, you're not a fighter, so we don't really need you for that. And we can take down Harold for you in a way that won't bring him back as well. And Ward will control all of Rand Industries, and Joy will be safe no matter what. Uh, back with uh, Danny, Colleen, and Davos. Davos doesn't trust Colleen. Uh, everyone's getting emotions to get the better of them. There's a lot of yelling involved. And this gets interrupted because uh, Ward went back to the penthouse to warn Joy about Harold. He explains about what he's learned about the hand and the resurrections and that it's a uh, state uh, for uh, Harold about a piece of Harold's soul essentially being missing uh, to try and get Joy to come along with him or pulls out a gun to hold uh, Harold off and so then that it's revealed that Bakudo actually followed him uh, Bakudo basically takes everyone hostage shoots Joy uh, and calls Danny, shows him Joy bleeding, and he shows that uh, he's going to decapitate Harold Meacham, uh, which will prevent any hand resurrection from happening. So I guess the hand are the immortals from Highlander. <laughs> anyway, uh, Danny basically goes to the, uh, to the penthouse. He arrives just before they can decapitate uh, Harold. Uh, as uh, basically the hand then take Danny into custody. And as they leave, Danny manages to temporarily charge the Iron Fist up and break free. Davos and Colleen arrive, and the big fight begins. 
eventually Danny, Colleen, and Davos go after Bakudo, but it eventually falls to uh, Colleen to take on her sensei, and she manages to win the battle. She pins him down. She cuts him. She stabs him in the leg with her sword. He actually breaks her sword, and she takes the blade and throws it right into his leg. She then uh, cuts his, cuts him in the chest, cuts him in the stomach. She wants to kill him, but she won't do it. And they basically said, no, we're not doing this. And Davos gets angry and stabs uh, Bakudo. And this gets Danny and Davos to begin fighting. And Danny, basically Davos, through the whole time, has been... He's been hiding his he's been trying to quell his emotions as best he can. He's upset that one, Danny got to be the Iron Fist and not him. He's upset that Danny, you know, abandoned Kunlun. You know, the Fist is supposed to guard the pass to, to Kunlun, passage to Kunlun. He's not supposed to be in New York City. Um, and Danny finally apologizes and he explains that he knew he had to protect the whole the world, not just Kunlun. He yeah, to do that he needs to be a re all over. He can't just be in one place and expect the hand to ever be stopped. Uh, they fight and Danny charges up the Iron Fist one more time. He says, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to let you go. But this is, yeah, this is it. And Davos basically leaves when he says there will be consequences. And Colleen and Danny then notice that Bakudo's body has vanished. Anyway, uh, Harold and Ward get joined to the hospital, and at this point, Harold Meacham says, good news, we'll be, you know, the Meachams will control Rand. We don't really need Danny anymore. So, and that's as that happens. Danny and Colleen return to the dojo. You know, they spend the night together, and then the next day, a bunch of troopers begin to arrive, and it's the DEA, and at this point, Ward gets a message to Danny, says, Harold sold you out. And that's how that ends, and we go into the season finale, Dragon Plays with Fire. Uh, okay. Uh, Harold, uh, basically prepares to return to Rand. Uh, he returns to the headquarters, uh, Rand Industries headquarters. He finds Ward talking with Jerry Hogarth, and Harold tries to pass his return off on a combination of advanced gene therapy and advanced cryotherapy. That, you know, how his body was sustained for so long. Also, he reveals that he had been messing with Danny long before uh, his mysterious return. And uh, basically, Colleen and Danny uh, use Claire to get in contact with Jerry Hogarth again. Colleen is also wanted because she's been assisting Danny in all of this and informs Danny, of, uh, Jerry informs Danny of Harold's return to Rand Head Industries. Then he intends to live in the public eye once more. And basically, he, Harold has the only evidence that would ever absolve Danny of anything. Uh, it's on a tablet that they had used. Uh, it's basically the... What Harold did was he transferred everything so it looked like the hands drug dealers... Uh, the drug deals were masterminded by Danny Rand, when in reality they were masterminded by Madame Gao. So the only person who could exo possibly absolve Danny would be Madame Gao. The return of the monastery, which has all been abandoned except for Madame Gao's cell, she's been left to basically rot. Danny opens the door, and they're talking, and Gao says, Listen, Harold came to me when he had can. He wanted control of the uh, company as best as he could. He wanted, put, yeah, Harold is the one responsible for your parents' death. Not the hand. Yes, it was hand poison, but, you know, after that we were not really involved. It was Harold. And Danny, he says, listen, if you're going to become the Iron Fist, you need to confront some personal pains here. You need to get over your personal beefs. You can't just be out here to avenge your parents. You have to be out here to try to actually fight off the evil. And the only way you're really going to be able to do that is if you kill Harold Meacham and avenge your parents' deaths. Ward, as this is happening, Ward tells Joy about Harold, telling Danny out. Uh, Joy, at this point, pretty much does not want anything to do with her brother uh, because he got her shot. She doesn't entirely believe it until he shows uh, her the newspaper, a newspaper headline with Danny being wanted, with Danny's wanted poster in it. Um, and 
uh, Ward meets with Danny and they begin to plan a way to get their hands on the tablet that would absolve Danny. And Joy confronts Harold at this point and she begins to piece together again that Harold is bad news and she needs to get out of there. Uh, at this point, Ward sees Joy, but again, she doesn't want anything to do with him. She basically just gives him a look and he sort of understands that she's not coming back. And at this point, uh, Danny, uh, Ward tries to find some, goes up to the office and he notices Harold has uh, a lot more security than originally planned. He tries to contact Danny, but at this point, Ward hits him with a golf club, or Harold hits him with a golf club, and Danny basically has to find an alternate way. He manages to charge the Iron Fist up enough to crash into a building. Uh, Colleen makes her way up the stairs. Uh, they're fighting through everything. Uh, Danny pounds the floor of the Iron Fist before Harold has a chance to shoot Colleen. Uh, the fight eventually escalates onto the roof. Harold shoots Danny in his fist, in his Iron Fist hand, so he doesn't know if he can charge it up again. And Danny and Harold begin fighting. Danny lands a massive kick that gets Harold impaled on a pipe. And at this point, Danny's he's fighting the urge to kill, and he says, no, you have to get over this. And eventually he, he does. He doesn't let his anger consume him, and he lets, he says, no, I'm not going to kill you. I have moved on. And as this is happening, he actually winds up charging the Iron Fist again. So it seems that he has a better control of it. Uh, Harold breaks free, and he starts moving to shoot Danny, but then Ward arrives and shoots Harold, who then falls over the side of the building. And um, no, he was not decapitated, but... Not to worry, before he gets revived, uh, they have Harold cremated. And as this is happening, uh, Jerry Hogarth returns, says the charges against Danny was, were dropped because of the evidence that absolved him. They also, as long as he pays to uh, the health costs for the agents he entered in his initial squabbles, everything will be fine. Uh, Danny returns to Colleen Wing and offers to take her to Kung Lun. Um, and then we get uh, two closing images, which is Joy meeting up with Davos in France. And it seems that both of them are now members of the Hand, because Madame Gao is not too far away listening to their conversation, and they're both plotting against Danny Rand. Meanwhile, Danny and Colleen go to China. Uh, they get to where Kung Lun is supposed to be located. Uh, they find a bunch of dead Hand assassins, and the mystical city is missing. And that's how the season ends. You gotta fight hate. You gotta make a stand. That's what the X-Men are all about. Man or mutant, it's all the same. The fight's against evil. Marvel Comics X-Men, today's most popular superheroes. Saturday morning's hottest TV show. And America's favorite comic books. Marvel Comics X-Men. Headbanging, pulse racing action. Isn't it time to see what the shouting's all about? Available at the Dragon's Den on Central Avenue in Yonkers and Greenwich Avenue in Greenwich. Introducing X-Men Projectors, where you project X-Men action scenes from the TV show right on your own walls. Put the action disc inside Wolverine, then throw the picture onto your wall. You control the action. Oh, uh -oh saber too. Yeah. Make it small or big. Cool. And in the picture yourself. X-Men action right on your walls and ceiling. Then change discs for more amazing action. Gotcha! X-Men Projectors. Each sold separately with three discs apiece. Batteries not included. Okay, so with the wrap-up of the series, let's actually sum up both of these series. Uh, first off with Luke Cage, and let's take a look at the pros. I love the fact that this show is kind of unapologetically African-American. Uh, you know, I love the hip-hop soundtrack throughout all this. I love the way they frame Harlem. They don't make it look grungy and dingy. I mean, there's obviously criminal activity going on, but they, they also show that there are good, decent people living there as well. There are people fighting and scratching. They make references to the Harlem Renaissance. There are people who are bad, like Pops, who are trying to turn a new leaf. People like Luke Cage who are trying to turn a new leaf. Uh, you know, I love the performances from Mike Coulter and Rosario Dawson and Simone Missick, Alfred Woodard, uh, Theo Rossi. Uh, who played Shades. I thought there was really great action. Uh, again, great superhero action throughout all of this. And, you know, again, like I said, I love the hip-hop soundtrack. Um, that being said, the series was far from perfect. 
as much as I did like a lot of the performances, I found the main villains to be kind of weak. Uh, I mean, Cottonmouth spends too much of his sty, uh, his time. Uh, sorry, Cottonmouth spends way too much of his uh, part of the story plotting, and then when he finally start, starts trying to actually do something, he gets killed off. And a uh, Diamondback, he's just way too off his nut. Uh, I mean. It would have been nice if he was a little more... Like, there were times where you could see there was a really good villain going through, and the next thing you know, he'd be off rambling and, and cracking jokes and making references to the Warriors, and it's like, what in the world is going on here? Um, I also... The backstory felt disjointed, really disjointed and out of place. Like, we don't get the Seagate... I understand they don't... Not to start with the Seagate stuff, and that's fine. I don't mind giving the whole backstory and not giving the whole backstory in the first episode. But even then, uh, the, it comes across being very disjointed. It would have been nice to see more interaction between a young Carl Lucas and a young Willis Stryker. Maybe see Luke take the fall for his half-brother. But no, uh, we don't get any of that. And, like I said before, uh, the final fight between Diamondback and Lucas... I'm sorry, Luke Cage falls really flat. It's really clunky. <coughs> mm. Sorry, like I said, uh, it's really poorly staged. It's really clunky. It's hard to tell what exactly Luke does to defeat Diamondback. I know there's something to do with the back part of uh, Diamondback's exosuit, and it looks like, like I said, it looks like Diamondback was maybe paralyzed, but I'm not entirely sure. But overall, I did thoroughly enjoy Luke Cage, so yeah, I'm going to give Luke Cage a B. Okay, and now moving up to the final thoughts on Iron Fist. Well, yeah, th this series was not very good, and we'll, we'll get to its flaws, but I would like to touch a little bit on the positives. Um, I did kind of like that they cut down the whole Danny uh, trying to reclaim Rand Industries storyline. Uh, I mean, that, that thing was going nowhere fast. I mean, it was tiresome after three episodes. I'm glad they, they nipped that in the bud, finally. Um, anyway, there was some good uh, there was some good performances in this. Jessica Henwick as Colleen Wing. Uh, obviously, Rosario Dawson as Claire Temple once again. Uh, David Venom as Harold Beecham was pretty good. Um, I'm winging this pronunciation, so do bear with me. Sasha Dunham, uh, Daham as uh, Davos. Ramon Rodriguez and Bakudo were good. They were both really good. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of where things go. Let's go to the, I mean, the cons. Well, lack of martial arts action in this martial arts show. Uh, way too much Danny trying to reclaim the company and then trying to read and meeting other people and going around and being maybe a little too starry-eyed. It, it just didn't seem to fit at all. Um... Lack of, again, lack of backstory. Like, no training sequences. Though That would have been fun to see. I think that's what people really wanted in the Iron Fist. Like, maybe you end the first season with Danny electing to go to uh, New York City to take on the hand. Or, you know, maybe do that in the middle of the season. Or even just interspersed training segment, segments throughout the series. You really don't get any of that. It's just, again, lack of, just so lacking in all of that. Um, the hand are villain as villains are they're really dull. Again, save for the leaders like Gal and Bakudo. Other than that, they're they're utterly disposable. Um the Meachams they get progressively duller as the series goes on. Like Harold Meacham goes from being this cool calculating guy to being this sort of bumbling psycho. That's the only way I can describe it. He he loses most of his teeth. Uh, Ward Meacham, again, where is everything going with him? I don't care about his stupid drug problem. I, Joy, she adds nothing. Like, you think maybe she's potential love interest, but, you know, nothing romantic happens between them. And it just falls. Like I said, they, <laughs> they, lost. they started being kind of interesting, and then they just stopped being interesting. And oh, let's let's address the uh, the whitewashed elephant in the room. Uh, Finn Jones as Danny Rand. He's he's trying, but again, I think this character got overhyped by Marvel. Like I think they expected him to be the big breakout guy, and it just didn't work. I mean, this is like he's he's part. 
I guess you would say Neo from The Matrix, Eddie's part, you know, Iron Man because of the money, and maybe he could you know, be kind of wisecracking and everything, but he, he doesn't have good wisecracking at all. He's not funny. He's, he's overbearingly douchey at some points. Uh, him constantly losing his temper doesn't... It just like... Okay, it's like every time someone slaps him in the face with what could be cold hard reality, he just flips out. And it's like, dude, calm down. You're supposed to be the centered martial arts guru zen master. And you, you know, yeah, um, I heard he gets better in Defenders. I guess we'll be seeing that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I could really give Iron Fist an F. I mean, there were some parts of this I did enjoy. I did, like I said, everything that involved backstory and actual martial arts fighting wasn't that bad. And some of the performances were pretty good. I just, it was the actors doing with what little they had. That's the, I think that's the best way to sum that up. Uh, so, yeah, I'm giving Iron Fist a D. <sighs> okay, so next video up after this is going to be on Saturday. That'll be game night, the game night review. Uh, then on Monday, we'll have the Elimination Chamber review. Uh, see you all next time after that. And don't forget, our Marvel Netflix catch-up finally progresses on as we finally start tackling the first two episodes of both The Defenders and The Punisher. Hey guys, is there a movie you want me to tackle? If it's some stinker like Baywatch or the Emoji Movie or something else, check out my Patreon at Sleepy Time for Cat Productions. See how you can make that happen.